Greetings, everyone. My name is DJ Wells. I'm the executive director of the Mensa Research Institute, and you are tuning in to our weekly conversation. Uh, we've, as you're well aware, we've been doing these conversations on a regular basis to talk about issues that uh, have become more and more of concern as we wrestle with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today, as always, we're joined by Dr. Mensa, uh, and also with us today is Dr. Deanza Spalding. Deanza Spalding, uh, sorry, my. Uh, my diction isn't what it should be this, this afternoon, but uh, Dr. Spalding joins us from Seattle, Washington, uh, where she's a mental health therapist and the founder of Renew Therapy in Seattle. Uh, she's also an adjunct faculty member at the Seattle Institute of East Asian Medicine, where she teaches cross-cultural communication and mental health assessments for patients. Uh, but most importantly, as it relates to our topic today, she has been a domestic violence advocate and researcher for more than two decades. Um, today, we're going to be talking about domestic violence and uh, some of the, the, the nuances of um, this stay in place order, the shelter in place order that uh, has kind of changed the way all of us interact. Uh, so. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the introductions. We'll turn this over to Dr. Mensa and Dr. Spalding in just a second. I want to remind all of you that uh, the Q&A function is available there on your screen. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen of your webinar uh, portal there, uh, you should be able to click on a button that says Q&A. Type in your questions because uh, we're going to let Dr. Mensa and Dr. Spalding kind of start us off with this conversation for half an hour or so, let them talk about some important issues that uh, are facing all of us, and then they want to uh, give you plenty of time to answer so that they can answer your questions. So please do type those questions in, and in about 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to come back in and start feeding those questions to Dr. Mintz and Dr. Spalding so that we can address your concerns uh, as well as provide you with some important information that Dr. Mensa and Dr. Spalding think uh, is critical for this particular topic. So without further ado, Dr. Mensa, uh, thank you for joining us. Dr. Spalding, thank you for joining us. And Dr. Mensa, please take it away. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wells. <clears throat> we have a um, a very, very important construct to discuss today, and that is of domestic violence. Um, when Dr. Spaulding and I were talking a few days ago, she used a very important term. She used the term invisible. And within the context of who are the invisible amongst the invisible, mostly females who are the victims of domestic violence, um, and males can also be the victims of domestic violence. It's very interesting. We usually think about it the other way around. But at this particular time, let's think about this for a moment. At some point, if they're able, a victim of domestic violence might be able to at least try to escape. Well, now we've got a, a shut-in order where we're kind of forced to be together in the same environment. And it's not quite so easy anymore. Given push to come to shove, no pun intended here, Yes, one can, can do one's best to extricate oneself from the situation, but here's a conversation that simply isn't had well enough during this particular point in time. So that's why I'm very pleased to have Dr. Spaulding join us um, to give us real insight and real discussions around this very, very important topic that gets left behind. We are in a very serious time. We understand that people are dying. We understand that people are very sick. We understand that. But with so many people who are doing okay, but are now mentally challenged or, or suffering more critically because of anxiety, depression, worsening states of, of fatigue and hopelessness and frustration, one may begin to lash out. And so Dr. Spaulding, I want to thank you for coming and joining us today and we're looking forward to your insights. And Dr. Spaulding, could you share with us a little bit of your background and, and why you got into this field? Absolutely. 
I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Mensa and DJ, for having me a part of this conversation. It's a conversation that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, partly because I'm just passionate about the health and well being and safety and empowerment of women. I, I really got into domestic violence advocacy work to empower and to support women that were going through these situations. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, these situations sometimes are also a part of our own personal stories and experiences that really inform kind of, you know, where we want to be in the world and how we want to be involved in the world and how we want to extend support um, to other people. And so, um, Domestic violence is part of my history. It's part of my family's history. I uh, watched my grandmother go through domestic violence in her third marriage for decades. And I really saw mostly the toll that it took on her children, my mother being one of her children, who felt like um, because of the years of abuse and assault and brutality, where there'd be times when this man would hold a gun to my grandmother's head or use her children as a way to um, control her and maintain um, complete power over her. Uh, my mom got to a point where she couldn't even be in contact anymore with my grandmother. And as a result, that impacted my relationship with my grandmother and my ability to also be in contact with her. And because of the nature of domestic violence and the shame that comes up in families that deal with domestic violence, a lot of times these issues are not talked about. They're not discussed. There's no conversations that are happening in the family system. And then what happens is sometimes that cycle gets perpetuated. Mm -hmm. And I found myself in my 20s um, marrying a man and becoming um, involved in an abusive relationship. And I didn't see the signs, I didn't recognize um, just all of the, the subtleties of, of um, domestic violence that were occurring in the relationship. Um, our very first physical altercation happened about a month before our wedding. And even then, I, I felt so much shame and so much embarrassment because Interestingly enough, I also was a domestic violence advocate. I was being trained as a domestic violence advocate at that same time. And I just thought, you know, if anyone should know, it should be me. And if anyone should be able to fix this situation, it should be me. And so I just kind of internalized a lot of shame around that and a lot of self-blame around that. And then also realized that I couldn't really talk to my family about it. I couldn't really discuss this and that there was no, um, we didn't have any kind of regular rhythm of talking about these things. So we all just kind of shut down around it. And I ended up getting married and we ended up staying together for 15 years. And there were many points in that relationship where things would escalate and I would physically have to flee for my safety. And this happened around major life events like my pregnancy and like after I gave birth to a child and after my child was about two years old, I remember one time just grabbing her with no shoes, no socks, nothing, and just running out. And luckily was able to run to a friend that was nearby and they were able to take us to a hotel. And so I think oftentimes we don't really understand the toll that domestic violence takes on the survivor. Um, for a lot of different reasons, not only because of the physical risks and harms that uh, survivors are exposed to, but the psychological tools that it takes because of the self-blame and the shame that gets internalized and the feelings of anxiety and never knowing when to predict or how to predict what's going to come next and, um, and, and what's going to occur and how the questions that I would always be asking myself is how am I going to provide for myself? How am I going to provide for my daughter when so much of our lives are intertwined financially and in terms of our housing and in terms of our just day-to-day -day basic needs with this other person? Um, and so that was a really difficult process. It taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about 
the difficulty and the challenges and barriers that survivors face going through this. It gave me a deeper compassion and empathy for those going through these experiences because in this society, we do have a lot of judgment about what people should do and when people should leave and how long people should stay. And it's much more complex than that. And every story of domestic violence is different and unique and personal to that individual. Um, so we have to have an open mind. We have to have a sense of wanting justice for families and um, the willingness to come alongside and empower families to do the right things for themselves. Um, and so when I got into the research, I started uh, doing research with Latina immigrants that were also dealing with domestic violence. And I really wanted to understand. So as a person that was going through that and who was a DV advocate and who, who knew what the resources were and who was a citizen of the United States, I still felt barrierized from accessing those supports and talking about it and, and, getting, and getting safe physically. So what was that like for individuals who were going through a process of immigration and all of those stressors, not knowing um, their, their new environment here in the United States and learning that at such a quick pace? How were they to know what those resources were and how they could access those things? And I oftentimes referred to them as the marginalized within the marginalized because DV survivors are marginalized in the society. We we like to judge DV survivors and say, you know, they need to leave or they need to stay or they need to do something about this. This is their problem. They need to deal with this. And, um, and in that way, we kind of push them to the fringes of society and make it um, even more difficult for people to talk about these experiences and not in, um, internalize the stigma around uh, abuse in the family system. Well, Dr. Spalding, that's tremendous. What a, what a difficult challenge. And just for points of clarity, um, DV stands for domestic violence. Yes, that's a really important point. You know, I, was, I, I did a webinar yesterday on this point and I was saying domestic violence, the context, is, the context of domestic violence is within an intimate relationship. And oftentimes we refer to domestic violence also as intimate um, relationship or intimate partner violence as well. So you might see those on, you know, when people are doing research about domestic violence or looking at different advocacy programs out there, those two terms are used interchangeably to talk about the same thing, power and control in a relationship, in an intimate relationship, and how um, an individual will use various um, strategies um, of aggression, intimidation, and manipulation to obtain and maintain control of their partner. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think what becomes very interestingly um, clear here is something that's not very clear to most people. When we think about domestic violence, we usually think about the person who is directly affected. So your mother, your grandmother actually being the victim and your mother watching, but then there's you. And what we see is that the individuals who are not necessarily physically touched are actually shattered in many ways. And that becomes a multi-generational phenomenon. Yes. We think about people who are abused, we think about people who are, are challenged in many different ways as becoming the next generation who actually perpetrate the next round of victimization um, pieces. But we don't usually talk about those who were witness to or the receivers of whatever kind of dysregulation that person who underwent the abuse is, is kind of putting out there. Emotional stress, anxiety, depression, all these things are, are put now into the entire environment of the child. The child knows something's not right. They become somewhat insecure, somewhat not knowing. And this sort of thing perpetuates itself even amongst those who weren't actually physically touched. So I want to thank you so much for that, for sharing that with us, because you're a very clear example and congratulations for coming through all this with all the challenges that you had to be the, the exemplary individual that you are. Um, but it's, it's a powerful story um, that lets us know, even if you're not physically touched, the emotional scars are there and that gets perpetuated. Doctor, when you, you start to work with your, your, your people, your, the people who come to you, what are sort of the first things that you share with them? 
about this construct they're involved in, in terms of domestic violence? That's a really good question. I think one of the things is we talk about um, like kind of humanizing the experiences that they're feeling, right? Because they're feeling like oftentimes when, when um, I work with both women and men and folks that um, identify all over the gender spectrum who have experienced abuse um, in, in partner relationships and, and family um, abuse and such. And one of the things that is a, a common thread among all of these folks is just a really uh, a, a deep sense of self-blame. And I noticed that even with children who are experiencing abuse, that that's one of the first thing that, things that is internalized in children is the sense of like, I should have done something to stop this, even though they had no power in the situation to stop this, this deep um, belief that there was something that they could have done to stop this, or there was a sign that they should have seen, or there was, you know, some kind of red flag that they should have known about and done something different about, or maybe it, it's their fault that they set this person off. Maybe it was their actions or their behaviors or something that they said that really set this other person off. And one of the things that I first help people to understand is that their human responses around feeling powerless in those situations and afraid and alone and isolated are very human uh, survival responses to a tremendous amount of trauma and stress that they're enduring. And the reason why I do that is to help contextualize harm so that it doesn't become something that people are internalizing as their fault that they should have done something, but that they can understand that, of course, they would feel frozen or they would feel like they would need to run away from the situation or not know what to do in a situation when an abuser is coming at them. Um, so it helps to um, give them some of that empowerment and that tools to understand what's happening neuropsychologically in their body, why they're having these responses, um, of frozenness and why sometimes that turns into a belief system that it's their fault and they're to blame. And then I help them break down and name what these harms are, what these traumas are. And I am very much about empowerment through saying, I believe you because there's enough people in their life and in their communities or in society at large that have told, uh, victims of abuse time and time again that this might be in your head or are you sure i know this person they certainly never acted like that when i was around them and so not only are people dealing with the self-blame they're dealing with this self-doubt that they're also internalizing from a lot of external messaging and sources that are mirroring back to them that they don't believe them so that's, that's something that's really an important part of the process is, I believe you. I believe what you've experienced. I want to work through and help you name what those experiences are. And it gives them a sense of agency over the experiences that they've had. And then we continue to do the work of helping people get back into their bodies and learn what it means to be safe in their bodies. Because oftentimes, People that are coming to me that are having trauma response or PTSD um, reactivity, they're uh, noticing all of those uh, symptoms come up like being, feeling frozen or feeling hyper aware and hyper vigilant about their space and their safety. And so part of that is learning how we can slow our systems, slow through our parasympathetic nervous system, and through our breathing and mindfulness. And I use a method called EMDR that helps um, create a bilateral stimulation in people's, um, in, their, in their brain so that their fight and flight response knows that they're not currently uh, in, in harm's way. They're not currently at threat. And that helps them to process the trauma as a complete experience that has an ending and they're not still living with 
and in the trauma as it, it, as it feels in the body and in the brain that it's recurring over and over and over again. So part of it is, you know, humanizing the experiencing experiences, giving people a place to name what the harm was and have some sense of depersonalizing it as their fault. And then hearing, you know what, I believe you, what's happening to you is real, it's valid. And then giving people tools and how they can be in their bodies and how they can, um, you know, navigate with, with different tools that give them more of a sense of agency in their decisions and their choices and their relationships and how they continue to move forward in their journey. Doctor, um, one just very quick point for people who aren't familiar. What is EMDR uh, exactly? Yeah, um, I use that acronym. I just throw it around all the time and I forget that it needs full context, but um, it stands for eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And it was developed by a psychologist named Francis Francis Shapiro, specifically for um, veterans that were dealing with PTSD response. And so, you know, if you look at PTSD criteria, what you notice is a lot of hypervigilance, a lot of um, activation and stimulation in a, in a person's nervous system, difficulty staying still, being still. And when we, we did a ton of research on this, what we learned is that it's because when people have had a traumatic experience, their fight flight response in the limbic system actually gets switched on. And what PTSD is that that switch doesn't turn off for people. Mm -hmm. And so their, their, their systems are turned on in a fight or flight state. And then their body, their brain is telling their body to release stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. And so that's why they feel all that reactivity in their bodies. And it's really uncomfortable. It's, hard to stay still. It's hard to trust your own senses and your own emotions and your thoughts and things. And so this bilateral stimulation actually helps the brain to communicate from the um, right and left hemisphere and reminds your brain that you're not currently being threatened so that you can actually process memory in a complete way and the trauma has an ending. Thank you, Dr. Spalding. Um, as people move through your process, what is the typical length of time, or is there really a particular length of time where healing really starts to begin? They're sort of addressing undoing and then moving forward at that point, because this person is not there by themselves. Usually there's a family member, there's a child or children. And then at some point, the potential for new relationships show up. And many times individuals who are the new person coming into the mix are oftentimes sort of the victims of reactivity, not necessarily violence, specifically reactivity that can either push individuals away or if you've got a, a wonderful, tender, loving soul, um, pushes even that thread that could be there, that could be a really great support piece for that individual. What yeah. do you say in your process is sort of the time for really starting to heal so that you can move forward? Well, I think the healing process starts the moment the individual says to themselves, oh no, this isn't right. I want something different for my life. And that doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not they are still staying in the relationship and trying to manage it in the relationship and create boundaries and safety for themselves while they're in the home or whether or not they've left the relationship. I think that process starts no matter where, where they are in that um, decision to, to leave. Um, because that's a powerful moment for people. Um, oftentimes when, when people are going through abuse, again, they, they, don't, they don't necessarily um, attribute certain behaviors as abusive. They don't understand that those uh, behaviors have been abusive to them. They have a, a certain feeling or an uneasiness or they don't feel great or they're wondering like why they've been depressed for years um, in these conditions, but they don't necessarily um, make the connection that how the uh, other individual is treating them is mm -hmm. abusive. And so the moment that they realize and they're like, no, I want something more for myself. I don't, I don't want to accept this as the norm or as something that I have to just accept in a relationship. That's the moment healing begins. And 
Um, that process, you know, I think healing is ongoing through people's, pe through people's journeys. Um, I think advocates are right at the, at the, for at the front lines of that, where they, um, when they start meeting with a client, they're talking about all the basic, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, housing, food, security, um, getting people in, in safe places, connecting them with job resources and, um, you know, educational programs, how to get kids back into school and um, what are some of the safe avenues for that. Legal repercussions, oftentimes um, uh, survivors have to, you know, look into legal avenues of restraining or uh, restraining orders or protection orders. Sometimes that can be even more complex for children. And so you have to go through family court. I think for the women that I, I was working with who were um, immigrating here from Mexico, they also had the added layer of dealing with the legal process around immigration and how to find safe ways to do that too because oftentimes abusers would use their immigration status and, and um, the fact that they were kind of in between in the process as a way of, you know, um, threatening and to, to control, you know, threatening them in order to maintain control over, over their, over their partner as well. So it can, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a difficult process. It can be a longer process. Um, but I think that's the beauty of the reality that we have advocates out there that are trained to come alongside you, that are trained to do all those wraparound services, that understand all of those pieces that you need, that you're thinking about. Because when people are thinking about leaving, they're thinking about, oh no, where am I gonna live? How am I gonna pay for where I'm living? Like, where's my food gonna come from? How am I gonna feed my child? Um, those are just so basic, obviously basic human needs that we have and oftentimes, those fears about how they're going to be able to provide keep them from being able to leave certain situations. And so advocates help uh, survivors walk through each of those and, and are knowledgeable and know where those resources are. And then the therapeutic process is another part of the process, but, and that can, and I feel like that can come alongside and uh, continue to um, just support the emotional, psychological um, healing and health of the individual. Dr. Spaulding, I'd like you to talk about some of the more subtle versions of domestic violence. Many people might not perceive it as violence because there's no actual physical contact, but the subtleties around minimalization of uh, even just commentaries that are about as um, vocally variant as we're speaking now. Sometimes just a very simple pattern of casual conversation, but highly negative in implication and orientation for the person who is the victim. And people don't realize that. And oftentimes they think, what have they done wrong? Because, well, he doesn't hit me, or she doesn't hit me. Um, but they're oftentimes very belittling commentaries. What percentage of the population do you experience that with and how do you help these individuals move forward as well? Yeah, that's a really important point to bring up. I think that so much of the abuse is housed in those subtleties. You know, as a society, we oftentimes look for the stereotype in domestic violence. We're looking for the, the, the beatings and the, the physical aspects of domestic violence, but we don't always understand that much of domestic violence happens in these very subtle underlying kinds of ways that create this sense of like confusion and disorientation and self-doubt in the survivor. And so yesterday I was talking about this a little bit in the other webinar about how some of those subtle practice, practices can look like, you know, just how, a, how, a, how an abuser is isolating, you know, people from their family members. You know, and, and it, sound, it's, it, it seems so innocuous. Like I would talk to um, some of the women I was talking to and they'd be like, you know, at first it sounded so sweet. Like he just wanted to spend so much time with me and just me, you know? And of course, like we were falling in love. I wanted to spend time with him. And I was just, 
become a little bit more like, well, no, I don't want you talking on the phone with your, you know, with your family. You know, I don't want you talking to that friend. Oh, I don't like that friend. A lot of jealousy. I don't like that friend. I don't like the way that they, you know, look at me or I don't like the way that they do this. And then that evokes a sense of guilt in the survivor. Like, oh, okay, well, I don't want you to feel like that. And so then they start feeling like they're kind of emotionally caring, you know, trying to manage and emotionally manage the abusers, you know, all their anxieties and, and things. And what would happen a lot of times for women that I would talk to is that it would just start out subtly like this or just little undermining things like, you know, they would be uh, going out and looking for work and, um, you know, doing the best that they could. Some of them had to work as laborers and didn't have work visas. So it made it very difficult to find work, but they would go and they would find work and come home and just little comments of it not being good enough or who do you think you are? Wow, you think you're special. You know, just these little, just subtle ways that just are just undercutting of the individual's dignity and mm -hmm. integrity and yeah. value and has them start to question that of themselves. Like, wow, did I do enough? Like, is there something wrong with me? Like, should I be doing something different? And, and then eventually as survivors would be like, you know, no, like I do want to talk to this family member or I do want to reach out to this person, you know, kind of pushing back a little bit or like challenging some of these abusive behaviors, then that's when it would start to escalate more and more and more. And sometimes that would involve getting the kids involved in the middle of uh, an altercation or physically getting violent or starting to make physical threats of violence around, if you leave me, this will happen to you, I will find you and this will happen to you. Or threats about, well, if you call the police, you really, you don't have paperwork to be here. So really who's going to be taken? And if, if you're taken, then who, where are the kids going to go? And her, and her fear of like, oh, I don't want my kids to be left behind with this individual. So it starts off so suddenly. And I think oftentimes all the signs are just such that, you know, um, we don't necessarily always register them. Absolutely. So you talked about isolation and then undermining yeah. and basically minimalization. And these individuals develop a very poor sense of self-worth value. And then they begin to really question whether or not their own perceptions are realistic because of the repetitive nature of these subtleties. It reminds me of a patient, um, very different. We had a very large male patient and um, he was married and it took one of his family members to help him understand that the feelings he was having over such a long period of time involved bullying. His yeah. wife, who was half his size, yeah. who had been slowly over time doing exactly what you said, yes. keeping him away from family, telling him bit by bit by bit what he was not doing correctly, how unvaluable he was, et cetera. And it's very interesting to see such a powerful man a fellow who looks hugely powerful have such a low self-worth and self-esteem because of what he considers to be something he must have done yeah. within the context of the relationship yes. to turn his loving wife against him that way totally. but it took a, a lot of time and therapy for him yeah. to really sort of understand what was going on so it's not always a, the female or a large yeah. person who uh is or small person rather who's the victim yeah. and not that we're, we're pushing men here what we're simply trying to show is that there are exceptions yes. and for anyone who's hearing these sort of, of, of words these seeing these patterns that you just so wonderfully explained um that they really need to reconsider who they're, they're dealing with and perhaps do a little bit to kind of reassure yourself and step yeah. up a little bit that hey you know what we have to challenge this this is not about a fight it's about making sure that they understand we're not going to be victims yes okay. absolutely i'm so glad that you brought up um the aspect of of males uh, dealing with domestic violence because that came up in in some research that i've done too and i think what's incredibly hard for men who are dealing with abuse is that we have a society that says that men don't deal with abuse and men are 
considered weak or you know less effective if they're being abused and so the stigma of that then also tends to create even more um, just barriers for males to come forward and say you know no this is this is not the way that I should be treated and that this is not acceptable or this is not okay. Um, they internalize it as something that is really their fault too, in almost a different kind of way, but it's supported by also how society uh, shapes how men are supposed to think and how they're supposed to be in a relationship as the provider and the strong one and all of these things. And so when I would have men come to me um, in, in research studies and talk about that, or even in therapy, like just how fraught they felt about even putting words to that because it felt like it was supposed to be something that was untrue because that's not what happens to men, but it does. One in seven men deal with domestic violence. Even issues out there, there are two issues I wanted to take a look at here, um, but even issues where we're regarding same-sex couples. Yeah. Right? And oftentimes, well, I'm not trying to put in the minds of anyone any preconceptions, but quite oftentimes there's presumed safety in what is perhaps a female-female or even a male-male relationship. And we see that there's still harbages of, uh, of these kinds of, of difficulties that are present. Uh, a lot of aggression, a lot of minimalization. And so there, there's a, a great deal of surprise around that. You know, do, you have, uh, do you see that a lot in your practice? Or yeah, anybody. yeah. No. But I looked up statistics on that. Forty-three percent of lesbians are dealing with domestic violence in their relationship, which is a really high number. Mm. And twenty-six percent of gay male males are dealing with domestic violence or have dealt with domestic violence in their lifetime. And mm. the dynamic around that again, I guess that's where it fits within kind of the the you know domestic violence power wheel, the power and control wheel, and as such, because. It really is about an individual who, for whatever reason, um, feels a lack of control in their lives. And that's where, during a time like a pandemic, where there's a lot of feeling like uh, we have no control over our external environments, people are losing their jobs, we are literally faced day in and day out with this invisible threat you know, um, this virus that we can't see, that we don't know where it's at and how it's gonna affect our personal lives, the people we love and so on. And so there's heightened anxiety and a sense of destabilization and a lack of control for people. And so oftentimes where an individual feels like a lack of control in their lives, they focus that on their home life and their partnership with their children and so on and so forth. If they haven't done some deep work of understanding that dynamic, maybe they've also come from systems of abuse, you know, family systems of abuse or other relationships where they've been abused. If they don't do the work to really understand that dynamic, it's really easy to perpetuate it and continue. Um, like I always talk about how trauma begets trauma. The only way that we stop the cycle of trauma is actually digging into our stories to understand what those experiences have been, how they show up on our bodies, how we think about them and how we build awareness around them so we can, can break the cycle and create something different in our, in our family systems. And that's essentially what I had to do, you know, for my kids and for myself is figure out, okay, how has harm impacted me to such a degree that if I'm not aware and if I don't do the work of understanding that, that I have the capacity to perpetuate those harms as well. And I don't want that for my kids. That's why I left the situation. So we create something new, um, even in the midst of something that can be so devastating and, and harmful. Uh, we have capacity, that's our resiliency, is that we can create something new and we do. And that's incredible. Absolutely, thank God for that. There are two words that you use that have concern and consideration. One is control. The other one is children. The people who don't have control in these situations are the children. Yes. And while we can talk about control as adults and trying to claim that, our children can't. Yes. They don't understand the situation. And so my question for you is, how do we now help our children through this process, even as we are being helped 
So for example, on your end of the situation, do you work with families together or do you have a separate therapist work with the children or is it a combination of the two? How do you process that to help the child who now is going through this internalization, perhaps even the self-blame that you mentioned before, that somehow or other they're responsible for the risk between mommy and daddy? Absolutely. I think that's an excellent point. And I think that it is, it's, it's again, the whole family system. So we need to get support for the kids as well. And that can mean getting them a therapist or working in a support group with the family as a whole, because really essentially the healing path to um, domestic violence is talking about it. It's the opposite action, right? Like in domestic violence, you know, in terms of, you know, societally and for stigma reasons and what we learn in our, in our family systems to keep things private, to keep things secret, to the healing process is about, you know, doing the opposite action and that's talking about it, giving people space to talk about their experiences. And that means children. And they have a lot to say about these things. They're just holding them. They just collect them and they're just holding them in and they're confused. And so I work with a lot of brilliant um, child psychologists and therapists who know how to do that work with kids to help, um, you know, foster a, an environment where kids feel like they're safe enough to talk about things um, and to just share you know, by, you know, by being curious about the child's world. And, um, and they use lots of different tools like play therapy and, um, and, and those kinds of platforms to help children to feel comfortable and trust and begin to trust and establish a relationship um, with um, either a school counselor or a therapist or, again, a support group leader can also be really great for that. And I think in most advocacy programs, they have services for the whole family. So there's things for the children too, to be able to get them that support. Excellent, excellent. This is one of those examples of what we would refer to as an epigenetic phenomenon, where the environment impacts um, genetic expression. Yeah. We, we talk about the idea when, quite often we get plenty of patients who have PTSD of some type or another. And those will come in and say, I have PTSD, can you help us? And we talk about biochemistry, which is what we do. We manipulate um, molecular uh, constructs and we help normalize them. But one of the first things I tell a family member or a parent who comes in and says, you know what, my child has experienced this, or I experienced that you know, as a child, as an adult, et cetera, is we talk about healing. And I explain our job and what we do is to help regulate your foundation mm. and get that supported as well as we can. But the next piece we can't do, we can't help you move through that process of actual healing. We can lay the foundation so that you can better receive it, but you need to see a therapist, which is why we're talking at this point, right? right? Yeah. You have to see somebody who's experienced to help you work through those difficulties yeah. and those changes. Absolutely. The, next, the next question we get after that is, well, can what has been done to my DNA, can that be shifted back in the right direction? We tell them, well, no, not exactly, not right now. But what can happen is that you can help move through this so that it stops at your level and expression for your children and your descendants simply is, is not quite as much of the challenge as what it is that you're experiencing and it help the healing process that way. So partnering with um, a, a good therapist, a good psychologist, a social worker, the entire team to help you move through this is absolutely essential. The children we find, uh, joys that they are, sad all the time for no reason. Yeah, yeah. One of the cardinal signs, and even sometimes the parents don't realize why, because the parents have processed this. They've yeah. moved through, but they never recognize that the child was there watching grandma go through this, watching grandpa go through this, or grandpa was an alcoholic and abusive, or whatever it may have been. But these are the people that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are these, these dynamics available. Absolutely. It's tremendous. Yeah. It reminds me of a story of, of one, um, one woman who was telling, telling me, you know, what ultimately finally 
like kind of just opened up her eyes was when her kids school teacher called them and said called her and said you know I got some drawings here uh, that's been going on with your with your with your little guy and you know I think that you might want to see these and she saw them and it it really expressed what was going on internally for him around um, all the fears and all the kind of um, chaos that they were living through and that be made it really clear to her about the impact it was having on him and influenced her decision to to get their whole family get her and her kids out into a safe living environment one of the things that you brought up earlier um, was more or less the cultural nature uh, of domestic violence and how that impacts you know, here in the United States, we're, we're such a, a wonderful mixture uh, of different ethnic groups and backgrounds and cultures and societies. But one of the things I hear quite often from a given patient or the, the parent of a patient when I ask questions involving history of families, and I hear, well, I don't really know if grandma was bipolar or great grandma was bipolar, because we didn't really talk about that sort of thing. Um, I come from an entire line of alcoholics. Uh, and I said, well, you know, do we know exactly what was going on here? No, we, we just didn't talk about it. They just drank and that's all they did was drink. Um, or we come from a very stoic background and I'm not going to name any, any ethnic groups, but certainly there are plenty that we know of, absolutely diverse in, in race, color, creed, et cetera, that have as a background extreme stoicism and privacy. We don't talk about these things. We just deal with them. And so we have a grandmother who just says, well, I dealt with it, you deal with it. And then this daughter is sitting there having to cope with all these issues without realizing that she's got the real capacity to go and seek help. She just was, has been told all of her life, even when she goes to her mother, that's just something we dealt with. That's how they are. This is what you just do. Yeah. And that feeds on generationally. So do you see a lot of that also in the stories that your, your parents, your patients tell you? Absolutely. I see, I see that. Um, so I see in a number of different ways. I think one of the things by and large that I see in almost every family background is that there's just a tremendous amount of shame. Like people mm -hmm. don't know how to talk about this and they're internalizing a lot of shame. Like something's wrong with them. They're not a normal family. You know, kids feel ashamed. They don't know why they're, you know, why, why they're, parent is treating their other parent in this way and they they see you know it's easy for us to compare our situation to other people's and like that that family over there looks really normal and they seem to be going about their business in this particular way I don't know what's wrong with my family so I think a, a lot of people um, no matter what the background is culturally speaking they're 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 internalizing those shames around it but what I've noticed with certain cultural groups like me being Filipino, and then I worked with Latin immigrants all coming from Mexico, that those kind of collectivist societies or collectivist cultures tend to be more, have a value system and norms, cultural norms that are around kind of maintaining privacy with, and, and that you deal with these issues within the family system. And then certain behaviors, and this is one of the things that I learned uh, with the Latina immigrants that I worked with is that certain behaviors are seen as just kind of uh, uh, just regular gender norms. So for some of the women, they would discuss it and they would talk about kind of machismo culture and how, mm -hmm. you know, being strong and being in control and, you know, and, and being the provider in those kinds of ways. That is a very important cultural value that families have um and so this was just an extension these behaviors this the abuse was just an extension of being in control because that's what you value from you know a male in in your family and um women also described another cultural feature called marianismo where that was you know it was it was seen as an important cultural value to you know, be, be a helper, be a support, be submissive in that way to come alongside 
And so for women who are like, no, I don't, I don't want to accept this anymore. I don't want to be abused anymore. Sometimes in their family systems, that was difficult because it went against what those gender norms um, were and how those were cultivated within the family. And sometimes part of this concept of machismo, um, of this is what they do, can often involve infidelity. And for many individuals, there are multiple episodes of infidelities and subtle, but the perpetrators don't really oftentimes recognize how belittling that is to their yeah. mate, their partner, on both ends of the spectrum, whether it's male or female. Yeah. Because that sense of self-worth, you, you have given yourself to this individual as part of a unit, and you have basically laid yourself bare emotionally and vulnerably to the idea that this person is going to protect you, you're going to protect this person, and there is no other shield. Yeah. And when it happens continually, then this also produces a sense of extreme minimalization and uh, really cognitive or emotional violation. It's, it's also a form really of, of abuse. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I wanna just add something to you um, in regards to cultural gender norms. I think there are some really kind of rich and beautiful aspects to the various cultural gender norms. And I think, um, you know, some of those cultural gender norms, whether it be machismo or marionese, they, they serve a function in how we're supposed to be in the family. And so some of these experiences I'm talking about are like outside their outlier to just kind of the richness and the diversity in expressing how family members are to be, what could they can expect and how they treat each other in the family system. So I just wanted to make that you know, little caveat as well is that, you know, these kinds of issues of domestic violence happen in all sorts of families all across um, cultural boundaries and experiences, um, like we were talking about earlier. And so it's just really important to hold that balance, you know, and, and that sensitivity around, around those kinds of, you know, features that we see. Absolutely. The value is quite key, and the, the question of relationships being situations of value yeah. and abuse being situations of devalue, and yeah. that's something that we, we really keep close here. Um, Dr. Spaulding, I, I, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> so much to talk about, but I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for our, our folks out there to ask questions so that you can share with them. Mr. Wells, do we, do we have I, I any was, questions? I was just about to try and butt in here, and, <laughs> and I agree that this conversation was going on so well that it was difficult to do so. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we do have a couple of questions, and, and certainly uh, I want to invite other folks to ask questions. We're coming up close to an hour now, and so we will stay, uh, Dr. Spaulding, if you're available, we'll stay a, a little bit longer so that we can answer a few of those questions. Um, but, but one that, that just came in uh, is asking if our genetics are set up, uh, I'm sorry, if our genetics are set due to trauma and epigenetics, Dr. Mentor, you had mentioned epigenetics before, how does one stop this generational transmission? Uh, especially when someone uh, may not even understand that their genetics have been altered. You know, are we talking about nature versus nurture here? Mm. Well, one of the things that we sort of reference is that there's really no such thing as nature versus nurture. Okay, that was, that's an archaic concept that is not really correct. Epigenetics, by definition, is nature interacting with nurture. Mm. and not diametrically opposed constructs yeah. are the, the sum total of our experiences superimposed upon our DNA. So the way I kind of share this is um, I, I talk about, people have heard me talk about my twin studies and how I love evaluating twins. Why does one twin become a drug dealer and another one become you know, a, a policeman? Very rare, very rare. Most of the time they kind of follow similar paths. But the idea here is that when you've got an environmental insult, you become different than if you never had that environmental insult. Same DNA, 
but now you've moved through a different pathway than what you normally would have. You may not be able to correct that change in what we call um, the, the genetic markers that have been altered, but through therapy and through work with, with a good practitioner, you can now move to a place where the emotional construct is not transferred onto the next generation. But you do also watch them because molecular nature has shifted and that can be passed on. So it becomes very important. I knew a, a young fellow um, back in the days when we were playing basketball uh, at the local gym for fun at the YMCA uh, years and years ago. And this young fellow told me that, you know, gosh, I'm going to go spend time with my son. Um, he's married, has a wonderful family. But he said, you know, I'm not going to do like what my dad did. He wasn't there for us. He left us. You know, I really didn't even know who this man was. He was basically saying that he had such an epigenetic experience that he wanted to make sure that never happened to his kids. Okay. So there can be some good benefit once we move through the process, but it's not a simple one. It's nothing you can take a pill for. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> okay. um, so that's kind of the deal with, with the nature versus nurture thing. Uh, Dr. Spaulding, uh, commentary on that. Well, I mean, it made me think about neuroplasticity and neural pathways and how, you know, the, the, the beauty of, of understanding neuroplasticity is that we're resilient, we can learn. And even though I think a lot of times when folks come into my office, there's a sense of hopelessness, like, you know, how can we make any changes or what is change gonna look like or they're feeling overwhelmed because they're not sure because these patterns, right? Patterns of abuse, especially in family systems that can go on for generations and generations and generations, you know, that's the template. That's what they've known. That's what they've understood. And so again, through the process of EMDR, which it could be really helpful, is that when, when we work with that bilateral stimulation and people begin to experience a calm brain, and when the brain is calm and the limbic system uh, understands that it's not being threatened, our frontal cortex, where we do all our linear thinking and organized processing, stays online, and people are able to learn and grow. And, I, and, and that's part of the, the neural pathway and the um, neuroplasticity and the healing that can take place from even a neuropsychological level. And, you know, I just believe in the human spirit. And I believe that people um, want to learn and they want to grow. And sometimes they're not sure where to go with that or how to understand that. But the minute they walk in my office is the minute I, I witness them saying yes to themselves and yes to learning and growing and doing something different. And that's powerful. It's a powerful thing. You said something very key, the human spirit. Mm -hmm. With all this going on that doesn't involve physical trauma that we sort of talked about, isn't really what they're doing attacking the spirit of the person. If you can destroy the spirit significantly, you can control that individual for eternity. Yeah. And so the spirit is indeed that powerful reservoir that we have. Thank you, Dr. Spalding. As absolutely. well as... Uh, yes, absolutely. Very powerful. And Dr. Mensa. Here's a question that's kind of geared probably more towards you. Got to be one of our uh, one of our regulars um, because they're talking about methylation status. Um, but certainly, Dr. Spalding, we we ask that you chime in on this again uh, as well. Uh, but Dr. Mintz, we are asked. Uh, someone's asking: Are there particular types of people? speaking specifically of methylation status or people who have specific mental health diagnoses who are more likely to be either a perpetrator of or a victim of domestic violence? Ooh, that is an awesome question. And one I don't get very often. I was all prepared to answer one way until you got to the latter part of the question. Um, there are some interesting chemical predispositions that lend themselves in one direction or another. So let's talk about undermethylated individuals. Many times undermethylated individuals are highly um, obsessive. They can be control freaks. They're oftentimes perfectionists. Now that doesn't mean they're gonna be evil with this superpower of theirs, but what it means is that 
there can be a great deal of frustration if things aren't properly regulated or controlled. When we have got the wrong emotional environment superimposed with that high perfectionistic capacity, there can be some difficulties. Now, I'm not saying, please, I don't want any emails telling me that I said, you know, people who are undermethylated uh, perpetrate this crime here. Um, and I do call it a crime. But what I'm sharing is that when we have the extreme people, the extreme controllers, who oftentimes were sensitive as a child and may have experienced this, they may perpetrate that through control um, with regard to their mates or their children and create trauma and difficulties there. What really came to my mind were overmethylated individuals. Overmethylated individuals tend to be highly creative, but more so, they can become very emotionally open. These are the people who are extremely great caregivers. They thrive in that environment. They're giving of themselves, they're self-sacrificing, and that's dangerous at some point. Because the very trusting, overmethylated individual who just is open to give is the one who's most vulnerable in terms of reception. They're individuals who we talk to right now. We've got a few patients who specifically are overmethylated and they talk about their difficulties with relationships because when they begin these relationships, they're just extremely receptive, extremely giving, extremely everything to the point where many individuals will actually take advantage of them, will become um, verbally uh, offensive, will do a lot of things because they know they can get away with it. This person is so willing to help and is so willing to be supportive, so willing to be emotionally there. Overmethylated individuals tend to be very, very impassioned. Some of them are, are virtually empathic. They're so feeling other individuals in situations and circumstances. They can become extremely susceptible and very vulnerable to the devastation that is wrought through any kind of violent situation, especially emotional violence. That's one of the reasons I brought it up because we don't recognize emotional violence as much as we recognize physical violence. And of course, physical violence does both. It destroys the body and the, the, the heart the mind and the spirit it does all of those things. So uh, when we talk about chemistries, look, both are going to be vulnerable in different ways. The person who's a, a very controlling individual who is a victim of control, that also tugs at the spirit. So when we have an undermethylator, uh, overmethylating an undermethylator, if you want to call it that, superimposing their will on a, another person, not giving them the capacity to speak and be free and to become a, um, an individual on parallel, in partnership, then that also becomes a very difficult relationship because they have to submit in ways that they don't typically want to. It's not part of their nature. Now, two undermethylators can work just fine together. Two overmethylators can work just fine together. And it's not as simple as, as chemistry. But when we talk about certain predispositions, there are little edges that either chemical makeup can have that can make them a lot more susceptible to a very specific kind of person and a very particular kind of approach as far as relationships are concerned. Dr. Spaulding, anything that you want to add to that? Well, I mean, in terms of predisposition, I was just thinking a little bit about those that are predisposed to like anxiety or, um, you know, those kinds of you know, uh, reactivity issues in their body. It made me think of the researcher, Lenore Walker, who's researched domestic violence and talks about this kind of from a learned behavior perspective and approach. And so um, I think that, you know, when people are have, you know, maybe they're already predisposed towards feeling anxious and feeling out of control uh, in their environments, and that's kind of just a, a feeling um, that they are constantly living with, that it, it might lend itself to people wanting to buckle down and control, again, their, their mate, their environment, and so on and so forth. And I've just got a follow-up question here, Dr. Mensa. Uh, someone asking specifically about over and under methylation and understanding the related behaviors, um, asking is this a genetic alteration or an alteration in chemical makeup? Um, just, a, a, I guess, a, a better understanding of methylation status in general. 
Hmm. Well, the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and it's a very, very complicated issue because what we're talking about is really epigenetics in the mix. Okay. So let's talk about, for example, if someone has pyral disorder. Right now, my question is, who in the United States of America does not have pyral disorder going on or some tendency towards it? We're in a highly stressful environment. And when we are stressed, we have mood swings, we have anxiety, we have depression, we have a, a sense of internal um, disruption, uh, a lack of control sometimes. That's one of the reasons why we're having this conversation with Dr. Spaulding, because we're more predisposed if we're, we're thinking in that direction there's a heightened awareness or capacity to engage in something that is belittling to a loved one, um, emotional abuse or physical abuse. Um, that's when pyroluria, a condition of rage, of impulsivity, of agitation comes into play. Now there's the foundational chemistry upon which the right environment can cause explosive tendencies. That's not even methylation. That's the biochemical dysregulation that's there. And that can certainly be worked on very, very easily, very quickly. And so we can do better with regard to that. But the other side of methylation, now that's a, a much more complicated situation. And yes, there are predispositions, as Dr. Spaulding brought on, if your methylation status produces anxiety, then you become more susceptible. If your methylation status produces depression, then you can become more susceptible. So an individual who's either under or over methylated can certainly have either anxiety or depression. It's, it's not uh, methylation specific. But somebody, for example, who has a, a, a situation, say they are um, under methylated and having a strong tendency towards schizophrenia, okay? Repeated emotional traumas can actually push that genetic foundation into conditions like that. Most of the time we see that when somebody uh, moves into a schizophrenic situation, it's because there was a trauma, whether it's physical or emotional. And that superimposed upon chemistry can cause a really, really big challenge, a really big difficulty. So it's very, very complicated. It's, there's no simple answer to that question, but there are certainly pieces to that puzzle that are very clearly elucidated. And we can say that because we've got patients with all those chemistries who have many of these difficulties. I, I have another one of our regulars who, who's chimed in here and is asking um, some of these rage issues and, and, and the like, um, anger control issues could also be uh, attributed to copper overload, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I want to do here is I'm going to be very, very sexist, but in this sense um, of what we see in terms of the statistics, Copper toxic males are likely to be extremely um, impulsive, agitated, and violent in behavior. Um, it is one of those things that we see very consistently in assessment of individuals who are in prison for certain types of crimes. Um, we see that very early in their, their persona. Um, they'll be the oftentimes little mischievous kids. Um, for those of you who watch cartoons and TV, Bart Simpson, to me, would be a great classic um, copper toxic pyroluric little male. Okay? <laughs> um, and if you look at the, the kinds of things he does, he, he's very um, agitated, very impulsive. Um, and those particular traits can move one into, well, if you've got a situation where you're not feeling good or something happens, you kind of lash out at that person around you. So yes, a copper toxic male could certainly be there. And why do I bring up the copper toxic male? For those of you who don't know, most of the time when we talk about copper toxicity is with regards to a female um, who's gonna have anxiety and depression, especially postpartum depression issues. Um, they often have many physical challenges, including things like fibroid tumors or endometriosis. Breast cancer can be there as well. But the severe depression and severe mental dysregulation that happens because of it um, Dr. Spaulding mentioned in EMDR the hormone levels being uh, changed, cortisol and epinephrine. Copper causes dopamine, your lovely calm neurotransmitter, to turn into adrenaline. People are always on fight or flight mechanisms, or at least can be very, very quickly 
when you've got copper dismetabolism, as my colleague, Dr. Judith Bowman, refers to it as. So if we've got a copper toxic female, well, um, I'll be very honest with you, I'm not so sure I'm as worried about uh, her as I am the male or the other person that she's got to deal with because she may become um, quite defensive and fight back. It might be a good thing in that particular situation. But certainly those vulnerabilities exist with many different types of chemistries. And copper toxicity certainly does play a role with both male and female chemical imbalances in terms of how we deal with the environment at hand. So we've just got a couple more questions here. And I, uh, one of the questions is asking how folks will be able to access this webinar and some of our other webinars um, down the road. And so as we're wrapping up, I will answer that question in, in specific detail. Just want to let you know, because someone wrote that question a, a while ago, want to let you know that the answer is coming. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the last couple of questions here are speaking specifically to, I guess, the, the title of, of, of our webinar today, you know, the, the, the concept of preventing and overcoming domestic violence uh, in light of the pandemic. Um, so the, the last couple of questions here are asking um, pros and cons about leaving an abusive relationship. Where do we draw the line, especially? given this pandemic when you know we're kind of asked to stay at home uh, and then one other question that came in asking about resources you know are there specific resources that have been set up for people who are experiencing domestic violence in light of our stay-at-home restrictions dr Spalding. dr Spalding. yes dr. really good question um so I think it is important if, if people are not safe in their homes and there is a whole um, kind of um, way that you can develop or create a, a safety plan. And safety plans can mean sometimes what is safety when you're in your home. Um, where is a safe place, a room that you identify in your home that you can get away. Um, one of the challenges of this pandemic is uh, survivors are not getting a break from the abuser because we're together seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's nonstop, it's constant. Um, so finding even those spaces in the home, you know, establishing some code words um, with your kids or with someone that you've identified, a trusted friend, that kind of alert that you need to leave or you need specific, kind, you know, like with the kids in the home, you say a word and that means go to the bathroom together and that's your safety place, you know, with the phone. Um, for, some, for some, it's um, reaching out to a trusted friend or family member, or if that's not available, an advocate to help you develop an exit plan if it's unsafe to stay in the home any longer. And, you know, what I would say in these kinds of times, even with the pandemic, if you don't feel safe, physically safe in your home, don't stay. You don't have to stay. And there are people that will help you walk through that process. Just two days ago in this neighborhood, um, there was a man who took his wife and one-year-old child to gunpoint right in this neighborhood and the police had to show up. So I'm saying if you're, if you're not feeling physically safe, don't worry about reaching out and breaking those shelter in place rules so that you can get into a safe environment. And if, if you have you know, friends, family, places that are secure that you can go to, then that can be an option for you. But also advocacy programs are equipped to talk to you about what shelter looks like, what transitional housing might look like, or to give um, temporary funds to you so you can stay at a hotel or a motel. Um, there's something, it's not widely um, advertised, but there's something that most advocacy pro programs have all across the nation called flexible funding. That funding is earmarked specifically for survivors to use towards anything, absolutely anything they need. And that means if you're looking to getting a new apartment and you need first, last, and deposit, those funds are there to help with those specific kinds of needs or staying in a hotel or motel. Or if you have to rent another room for a friend down the street, it will help with those kinds of costs and expenses. So when you're calling 
and I'm going to give you um, the number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which is 1-800-799-7233. And the reason why I give this number is because it's a database for all the programs all across the United States. They know what's available. They can help connect you with advocates right in your local area. And also they can help you if you have questions and you're like, I'm not really sure if this is a safe situation or if this is an unsafe situation. I'm not sure if this is a situation where I should call the police or have someone else call the police for me. You know, um, they can help walk you through that and talk you through that. Also, if it's not safe to talk over the phone, they have a chat feature so you can do that securely and privately. And then I also have um, a resource that I can give to um, DJ and uh, Dr. Mensa around how to secure your devices. So sometimes abusers will get a hold of their partner's devices and try to control communication or know what the other person is doing. So in terms of being able to track people's phones now, you know, there's features, protective features that you can do on your phone to um, make sure that that's secure and safe and that person can't track where you are. Or, you know, uh, multiple verification processes so that you have your phone is uh, password protected and secure. And it works for other devices too. So I can also share that as well because that's an important way for you to maintain your uh, safety and privacy and confidentiality as you navigate uh, what next steps to take. Outstanding. Dr. Spalding, I know that you are in um, your particular region of the country, but I would think it would be absolutely wonderful if uh, those who are listening to this conversation could have opportunity to access you if for nothing else, your pearls of wisdom, in addition to what it is you've already shared. Would you like to share a, a, a professional email address or website or uh, any means of, of contact for question yes. and directions? Yes. So my email is deanza, D-E-A-N-Z-A, at deanzaspaldingcounseling.com. And my website is renewtherapyseattle.com. So you can, if you go to my website, there's a contact sheet on there as well that you can send me messages over that. And it also has a link to my email address on there as well and my office phone number. Thank you so much. Mr. Wells, are there any other questions? Uh, no, I think we've, we've covered uh, pretty much everything. Uh, that folks have sent in. So I do want to remind everyone, uh, we do have the one question that I just promised to answer, which is um, how can folks access this information if you didn't write down Dr. Spaulding's information quick enough and you need to go back and look. We will be posting a video replay of this entire webinar on the Mensa Medical YouTube channel. So you can go to uh, YouTube and type in Mensa Medical. There are several uh, of our past webinars. The video replays for all of those webinars uh, are there on that YouTube channel. We also post links to those YouTube videos on our Mensa Medical Facebook page. So you can go to either one of those places and find uh, links to the video replays of this webinar and any others. We encourage you certainly to to take a look at this again, revisit some of this outstanding information that's been shared. And if you know of others who need this information at this very critical time, please do encourage them to take a look as well. Uh, Dr. Mensa, Dr. Spalding, any final words before we wrap things up today? Dr. Spalding? You know, I just would want to say, you know, kind of just a word of like blessing and peace to all of you, wherever you are in your homes and whatever those conditions might look like. And to just state that you can trust your gut, you can trust your instinct if you're not feeling safe or you're feeling like you're being treated in a manner that is. Um, you know, diminishing your sense of worth and your value in the world, know that you can trust that instinct and that there are people out there that um, are ready and available to work with you and help you process and take the next steps that you need to take. 
I want to share with all of our daughters out there, it doesn't matter what age you are, no one on this planet should be able to put their hands on you in a negative fashion, and you tolerate that. If this is not something that you are to receive. It's nothing you're supposed to respect. It's inappropriate, and it doesn't matter who it is. Speak out about it, get help. It's a very, very powerful issue. I don't know. There's so many families out there that are affected by this one way or another. You know somebody who knows somebody in the worst case scenario who's going through this process. And that's why we brought Dr. Spaulding to talk about it. Dr. Spaulding, we're so grateful to you for sharing this information. I think it's one of the most powerful pieces of information that we can have, your wisdom and your direction. And you know, we'll be, we'd love to have you back again at some point in time to talk about this issue. Um, hopefully when it's beyond the coronavirus situation. But at this particular time, it's really crucial that we have this conversation. As you said, the invisible, the invisible who are invisible, the marginalized, this is where unfortunately many predators take advantage of that closed environment. And I'm so glad you shared with people that, hey, you know what, you can flee and you need to, if you need to. You know? yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Spaulding. Thank you, thank you so much for this beautiful and wonderful and much needed conversation. And thanks to all of you who have tuned in. Thanks to all of you who will watch this uh, later on. Uh, please do, as both Dr. Mensa and Dr. Spaulding have said, uh, please do reach out and get the help that you need when you need that help. Um, and we encourage you again to share this with your friends and your family members as needed as well. We'll be back again next week for another conversation, but in the meantime, stay healthy, stay safe, stay home, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much.